I've entitled the teaching this morning, Wilderness Blessings. So let's look to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Avinu Shabbat Shemaya, my Father in heaven. We thank you for sending your Ruach HaKodesh in our midst this morning. And Father, we ask that you would continue to breathe the Ruach on us as we look into your Torah. Father, I ask that we would have open hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. For I ask it in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Many times, people hear the words in the wilderness, which is the Torah portion of our Midbar, in the wilderness. Of course, in English, we call it numbers, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But you know, when Israel had a lack of faith and sin, it was not the wilderness that was necessarily the consequence of their sin. It was the wandering around aimlessly for 40 years. And I'm going to begin this morning with Exodus chapter 14. And I'm going to read uh, beginning with verse 3. And this is when uh, Israel came out of Egypt. And the Lord spoke to Moses. And he said, For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. I think this is really a prophetic saying that the Lord is giving ahead of time to the children of Israel. And they probably didn't know what the word of the Lord was talking about at this particular time. But he said, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And then, if you will go ahead and look at verse 12 of the same chapter, Exodus 14. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt? These are the people saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have even been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord. Then verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. That's a message to us today. We may be in the wilderness. Or we may be in bondage or slavery. But the Lord can deliver us. But when he delivers us, he wants us to go forward. It's so important to go forward. And then, looking at the first chapter of Bar Midbar, or Numbers, we read, Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. We're going to find out that the Lord often spoke to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And God can speak to us in the wilderness. And then it says in verse 2, Take a census of all the sons of the Israel by their families, by their fathers' households, to number every male and head by head 
and verse 3, from 20 years old and upward. Whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. Why is Bar Midbar the title given by the Jewish people to this book of Torah by Moses called Numbered? The reason is because it has a number of senses in the book of the fourth book of the Torah. And the number was important and Rashi says that God loves Israel and he numbers them all the time. And of course they were being numbered to prepare for the journey to be prepared for war. And we are always to go forward but we are also to be prepared for spiritual warfare. Anything that's of value, for example, some people count their money all the time. I mean, they're obsessed with their finances. And uh, if you want to know someone that's obsessed with their finances, if you work with them, sometimes they'll pull out their wallet and they'll count the number of bills that they have and later in the day, they will pull out the wallet and count it again. And uh, I knew one time when I was a hospital chaplain, when uh, one of the chaplains was not on the floor and down in the uh, office, uh, it seemed to me like he was always had his checkbook out, looking at the numbers and counting how much money he had. Anything of value, we often count. And at this time of tax season, I don't know if you've gotten your taxes yet regarding property and so forth. We got ours, I believe, Thursday, which was $2,000. And my wife said, why are we paying rent on a house that we've already bought? But you know, uh, they count, and the taxes are important uh, for the things that a county or a facility uh, want to do. The Parsha Bar Midbar always comes before Shavuot, and it comes on the first or second of Saban. And today is the second of Saban. The Torah was not given to a civilized world, but rather in a difficult place to live. The wilderness or desert is described in detail in Jeremiah 2, chapter 6. Jeremiah 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 6. They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed, and where no man dwelt. The wilderness is usually a desert place or deserted place. And it's important for Israel to come to the wilderness to receive the Torah because they need to have an open mind. And in the wilderness they would not be distracted by the things of the world or the things of Israel. Some have asked, why was the Torah given on Mount Sinai? It's one of the smallest mountains in Israel. And the reason being is that Mount Sinai was a humble mountain. 
And we have to be in a place of humility in order to receive the Torah and to incorporate it into our lives. We must empty our minds. We must be in a place of humility and surrender. And Moses delivered the Torah to Israel. And he was the appropriate one to deliver the Torah. And his name even gives the indication. Because if you spell his name backwards, it spells Hashem. In Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. This is the story that uh, Solomon is writing. And in verse 5, can apply to Israel. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? He's talking about the bride. And the bride is coming from where? The wilderness. She is leaning on her beloved. The bride is dressed up and ready for the wedding celebration. And the bride has been giving, given gifts from the bridegroom. Look at Exodus chapter 3, 21 through 22. Many people have the idea that when Israel came out of Egypt, she being slaves, wore parted garments, and uh, were not well dressed. But according to scripture, this is not exactly right. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 21, we read, I will grant this people favor in the sight of the the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go, you will not go empty handed. And of course we all realize that God had provided for Israel and now she was getting the rewards of all those years of bondage. And verse 22, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunk up the Egyptians. <clears throat> so many times we emphasize the fact that they plundered Egypt in order to provide for the tabernacle, which is partially true. But here, it says that God told them to put on the clothing and to put on the articles of gold and silver because it was his bride that he was leading out of slavery into freedom. It was at Mount Sinai in the wilderness that the wedding ceremony took place and the Torah or Ketubah was given. And of course, the Torah or Ketubah is the uh, ten words. <clears throat> this was the wedding contract. And that's why we celebrate Shavuot, to celebrate the wedding contract. We might also mention that there is a connection between the Hebrew words, the bar, and Midbar. They both come from the same Hebrew root. Devar means word. Midbar can mean mouth. Moses saw the burning bush on Mount Sinai in the wilderness. God spoke to Moses through the burning bush and he spoke often to Israel in the wilderness and he used Moses and spoke through him and Aaron. We know that the Bible says that 
during the time that Israel need to be <coughs> uh, restored in later centuries, we read in Hosea 2.14, It says, Behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness, and speak tenderly to her. If there's a problem with being in the wilderness, why would God want his bridegroom to come to the wilderness so that he could speak to her and talk to her and restore her? It could be that you need restoration in your life. And God may want to take you to the wilderness, a quiet place where there are no distractions in order to restore you to what you should be. God can get your attention and you can have an intimate, private conversation with Him in the wilderness. The wilderness was a place of uprooting. Israelites had no land or houses. They were devoid of all the things that would take their attention off from God. How many times have you heard people say, well, I can't go to a worship service because I only have one or two days a week free and I need to paint my house or I need to mow the lawn or I need to take my boat up or my four-wheeler because I spent a lot of money on these <coughs> items and if I don't use it, it's a waste of money. So we need to put away the things of this world and concentrate on the things of God. The desert was important for a change of mindset. The Israelites were leaving captivity and had to empty themselves of the habits connected to slavery. Are you in slavery to the things of this world? Are you enslaved to the culture of this world? In slavery, the Israelites did not have to take responsibility for their lives because they were told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. They lived in the arena where all decisions were made regarding their welfare. If you have been involved in a stressful occupation and you have been concerned with making a good living, you will soon discover that oftentimes you cannot make decisions for yourself because if you want to maintain your employment, you have to do what the employer wants you to do. And if he wants you to come in in the middle of the night, or if he wants you to do some terrible, ugly task, you need to do it, because if you don't do it, you lose your employment. So, there's no freedom, and God wants people to be free. God had delivered freedom to his people. Now they had to take responsibility for themselves. Bar Midbar has a numerical value of 248, the same numerical value as the word Abraham. We also have 248 <coughs> positive inst instructions or thou shalt. The Torah was not given within the boundaries of the land of Israel, but rather in the desert, where there are no boundaries in the desert, illustrating that the Torah is for all people. Oftentimes people have asked, well, why was the Torah given in the wilderness? Why wasn't it given in Egypt? Why wasn't it given in Israel? It was given in the wilderness so that no one could claim it. It belongs to both Jew and Gentile. It belongs to all people who receive it. 
The Jewish people learned the importance of the desert. You know, John the Baptist, for a short while, was a member of the Qumran community in the desert. It's located down in the south, next to the Dead Sea. And there, in the wintertime, on the mountain, uh, the, the, uh, or the hills, uh, there would be a lot of rainfall, and the rain would come down those wadis, and the community of Qumran had diverted the waters into cisterns and mikvahs, and they had water all year long. And in Qumran, you would ask, well, why did these Levites and Jewish people gather there to study God's Word? Because there was no distraction. There were no women there. They had their libraries, their scrolls, and so forth. And they spent all their time studying in the wilderness. I have always been amazed by the topic of the book Streams in the Desert by Mrs. Charles E. Cowan. Look at Isaiah 43, 19 through 21. Isaiah 43. In Isaiah 43, 19 through 21, we read, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it. I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. And just think of all the blessings they received there. They received food on a daily basis. They received water. Their clothing did not wear out. They did not have any sicknesses unless they were involved in sin. God took care of them and provided for them in a special way as only he can. God brought his people to the desert to prepare them for the future and now the desert blossoms like a rose. In God's plan he often calls people apart to the quiet place to prepare them to blossom like a rose. Yeah. In Acts 7.30, Moses spent 40 years, where? In the wilderness, preparing for his awesome assignment. Moses had been involved in murder, and he left the royal palace and went to the desert and spent 40 years taking care of the flock. Can you see him out there? There's nothing out there but sheep and the sky above him and the stars. And I would dare say that he had plenty of time to concentrate and to focus on God. And God changed this man. And he no longer became a proud person of Pharaoh's court but he became the humblest man on the face of the earth. I am always amazed by believers who say they want a close walk with the Lord, and they spend all their time 
watching TV. They spend all their time keeping up with the batting averages and uh, the sporting events. They spend all their time involved in the pleasures of this world. They spend their time with pornography. They spend their time with uh, riches, with making a name for themselves. And my dear friend, and I say to myself also, that is not the way to get close to God. In order to get close to God, we need to seclude ourselves in the wilderness and allow God to speak to us. And we need to speak to Him. I, that's one reason why I enjoy the Messiah co uh, Conference. The Messiah Conference at Messiah College in Pennsylvania, Grantham, Pennsylvania. It's a, a liberal arts college, actually, with a Christian uh, beginning. And uh, it's located out in uh, the community of Lancaster, where the Amish live and so forth. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, fruit trees, and if you want uh, any type of fruit dish, stop at one of those fruit stands, and you get a delicious meal. And it's so pleasant there because you have all these Jewish people from all over the world, from Ethiopia, from Israel, from South America, Central America, Canada, the islands. All these people gather together as well as the people from the USA, from various Messianic congregations. And they spend their time together. And there's not a TV, that's blaring, there's no radios, and people spend their time in fellowship with God. They can listen to God's word, and they can listen to the music, messianic music. Israel, in the devotion of the youth, followed God and did not worry about provisions for herself as she left Egypt to go into the desert. In Exodus 12, 39, we read, Israel had blind faith in God. We find this also in Jeremiah 2, 2. Israel did not ask, how are we going to feed ourselves? They had faith and they went. And when God asked you to go, you need to go. You need to move by faith. You need, as we read in one of the first verses this afternoon about going forward. We need to go forward. Numbers 10, 35 to 36. We have the record of the ark's journey in the wilderness. It was not just the people that were journeying, but it was also the ark. Could we have the PowerPoint at this time? The Torah scroll uh, has these two verses, 35 and 36, separated from the rest of the uh, portion in numbers. And what I want to point out to you is this, believe it or not, is a nun. And this is another nun. Now these are inverted nuns. The nun should be facing the opposite direction. So why does Numbers 10, 35 through 36 have the inverted nuns? That's the question. And Rashi asked this question. And I believe it is a prophecy and prophetic of the fact that 
The Torah was for both the Jews and the Gentiles. Numbers 10.33 says, Thus they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a resting place for them. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. The passage, bracketed by news, states, Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord! May your enemies be scattered! May your foes flee before you! And then, when it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Now this portion of scripture, if you're reading Bar Midbar or Numbers, seems to be completely out of place. And why is it separated? If you take the Torah scroll and open it up, or if you've got a Kamash, you will see that it is actually separated not only by the nuns, but about by space. And the Jewish people believes that it signifies seven pillars. They take it that these two verses is another book of the Torah. And you could understand that because it's an important passage about the Ark of the Covenant going forward. And it is just with the Ark of the Covenant. Look at uh, Proverbs 9, verse 1. Proverbs 9, verse 1. In Proverbs 9, 1, it says, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out of her seven pillars. Now wisdom in the Jewish mind refers to the Torah, the books of Moses. And it says she has hewn out her seven pillars. There's five books in the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Plus, if you take this, these two verses, and make it a separate book, and you've got passages on both sides of the verses, you come out with the number of seven. Seven pillars. The book of Numbers speaks mainly of the Israelites' journey through the wilderness. But this passage speaks of the ark's journey. Since Moses recognized that Israel would always have enemies who would take every opportunity to attack, he began each leg of the journey with a plea that God would protect his people as they traveled to the land he had chosen for them. Whenever they paused in their journey, he would ask the Lord to reside in their midst in such a way that the countless thousands could experience his presence. You know, I believe that today as we walk in this world and each day as we start out with the Torah in our hearts, we should ask the Lord this same liturgy that we say on every Shabbat. Rise up, O Lord, and as I walk this day, may your enemies be scattered, and may your foes flee before you. Father, Keep the enemy away from me. And then at the end of the day, we can say, Return, O Lord, for you have blessed us.
The Torah is not in the heavens. It was given here to us on the earth. Preceding this passage is the invitation of Moses to his Gentile father-in-law, Jethro, to join the journey of Israel, which reinforces the fact that the Torah is for Gentiles as well as the Jewish people. Following this account is the consuming fire among the Israelites as a punishment for complaining. This refers to the fact that God will purify Israel in the end times. Many people believe that the backward moons refer to the Gentile assembly of believers. Since the noon is a pictogram of a fish, which was the symbol of the early believers. And I believe these nuns are prophetic regarding the Gentile inclusion. If you know anything about the pictographs of the Hebrew consonants, you know that mem is water, and it's a wave. And nun, the next consonant, is a fish. Fish live in the water. Fish are full of life. And so, I believe that those nuns on either side of the liturgy that we speak here every Shabbat indicates that the Gentiles are included. Yeshua called us to be what? Fishers of men. He called the people forward that they would be his fishers of men. That is the reason the early New Testament believers used the popular symbol of the fish. The message of salvation is compared to a fishing net which would draw all people from darkness into his marvelous light. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we have an account of Yeshua being in the wilderness. He fasted and prayed. Remember, the Torah was given on a mountain in the wilderness. Now after Yeshua has been anointed by the Spirit at his baptism, where? In the wilderness. You have the story of Yeshua, he's being baptized by John the Baptist, and at his baptism, the dove comes down and descends upon him, and the dove is an indication of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit, and the anointing took place in the wilderness. Yeshua was not reluctant to meet his adversary, the devil. We read that he was led by the Spirit to a mountain in the wilderness. And he went because he was willing to, de to do the divine will. Yeshua was led into this ordeal by his Father's own Spirit. Yeshua did not invite the temptation on himself. Rather, it was the Father's will that this mighty battle be undertaken at this time. In a very strange way, God's will and the devil's will meet in a tremendous clash. After Yeshua's baptism and the Ruach comes down and descends upon him. This invisible spectator, Satan, realizes that Yeshua has come to crush him and destroy his works and to erect the kingdom of God among men. The devil at once resolved to break this divine champion.
Satan had conquered the first Adam. And now he sets out to conquer the second Adam, who is Yeshua. God will that this battle must occur. It did not happen haphazardly. It did not happen by chance. It was foreordained that Yeshua would be tested. Satan did not even bother to use his minions or his subjects to accomplish this. He was going to do it himself. It was a personal vendetta. And Satan here is devoted to man's eternal ruin. Yeshua had nothing to eat for 40 days. And so, he was hungry. Matthew says that after this time period, Yeshua greatly hungered. And at this time, we find out that the devil, Satan, tempts Yeshua for 40 days. And this was a very immense struggle that cannot be described in words. Again, none of the temptation arose from Yeshua's heart or his mind or thoughts or desires. The temptation was imposed on him by Satan. As in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Satan starts the temptation by raising a cloud of doubt. And notice that in the Greek that it actually says, if you are a son of God. The English translations will say, if you are the son of God. But actually Satan says, if you are a son of God, change these stones into bread. Satan didn't doubt that Yeshua could change stones into bread. But in so doing, Yeshua would be obeying Satan instead of God. Yeshua would then prove himself to be a false son. Yeshua conquers the tempter by acting as a true son. The devil's suggestion is not for one moment entertained by Jesus' mind. Yeshua replied, it has been written, not on bread alone shall a man live, but on every utterance going forth through God's mouth. The sum and substance of this reply is total trust in the Father. Yeshua met every assault with the word of Scripture. And that's why it's so important to incorporate the Torah into our hearts so that we can confront Satan and win the victory. Oftentimes people say, well, I have no victory over Satan. I fall into this sin, and I keep falling into this sin. But if they would hide the Torah in their hearts and have it ready to bring to their memory when they are tempted by Satan, they could thwart the temptation. It would take too long to explain the other two attacks other than to say that Yeshua quoted scripture. In, in Luke we read that the devil leaves Yeshua for a season. We know the devil tried to dissuade Yeshua from dying for mankind. In Luke chapter 5 verse 16 we read, 
But Jesus himself would often slip away. Where? To the wilderness. And pray. In Mark 1.32, Jesus in the early morning, while it was still dark, went to a secluded place and was praying there. It's very important that we begin our days in seclusion with Yeshua and his word. The wilderness was not only a place of temptation, but it is also a place of prayer. The wilderness is a lonely place and is therefore an ideal place to pray. I'm always amazed at believers who talk about praying and miracles. And you would think that miracles were very difficult to be accomplished. And you would think that praying would be so easy the way people describe miracles and praying. But the fact is, with Yeshua, he could do a miracle just like that. It was easy for Yeshua to do miracles. But for prayer, it was an exhausting experience for him. Look at Hebrews 5, 7. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Yeshua struggled in prayer. Sometimes our prayers are pale and weak. Praying is laborious work. As indicated in Colossians 4.12. Look at Colossians 4.12. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greeting, always laboring, laboring earnestly for you in his prayer, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in the will of God. Praying is labor. It's not something that we just mumble a few words. And we expect things to happen. But we have to labor in prayer. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against principalities and powers. Against the evil of this world. In Romans 8.26 we discover we do not know how to pray as we should. Romans 8.26 Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. We need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray all the time. So what do we learn about the wilderness? First of all, we learn 
that the wilderness was the place where the Torah was given. given. Why was it given in the wilderness? So that both Jew and Gentile and all the world would have the Torah as a guide. Two, the Spirit will lead us to the wilderness to test us. Testing makes us stronger as we resist temptation. Sometimes people say, well, I don't appreciate uh, the fact that uh, temptations come my way. But a believer will be tested if he follows Yeshua. When Yeshua prayed, he prayed, lead us not to, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He did not say, do not expose us to temptation. He said, do not lead us into temptation. And we will be tested. Number three, the quietness of the wilderness is the place of God's anointing. It's very interesting to me that Yeshua was anointed where? In the wilderness at the River Jordan. In that quiet place. Number four. The quietness of the wilderness is the place of prayer. You know, the wilderness has no appeal to those desiring to feed the appetites of the flesh. The wilderness is conducive for feeding the spirit. And my plea with you this morning, for you and for myself, is that we would spend more time in the wilderness alone with Yeshua. If we are going to be a vibrant, messianic, believing assembly, one of the things that we need to be in touch with is the fact that we have to separate ourselves from this world on various occasions and daily in order to communicate and have intimate conversation with Yeshua. You know, I go to these uh, Messianic conferences once a year, and uh, it's a very refreshing thing to do. But I know of a lot of people, believers, who never separate themselves and they never take time out. And my quote to you is if you do not set yourself apart, you're going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. It's very important that we maintain a communication and that we maintain a relationship with Yeshua. Sometimes people get involved in the work of believers and they feel tired all the time. And they feel like, oh, not another week. And no, not this. But the fact is, if we would take time to be a part with Yeshua, our attitude oftentimes would be a lot different. We would be rejoicing in Yeshua. We would be rejoicing in Shabbat. And we would be like some of those, even in our congregation, who say, I can't wait for Shabbat. Amen. And so we need to closet ourselves on a daily basis 
for a small period of time. But there are also times in our lives that we need to take a larger period of time to spend with our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. May God bless us as we seek to do His will. respond uh, to uh, that message first by just being completely silent and quiet and just giving before the Lord that you can speak to us you want to sit by your seat kneel by your seat kneel by the altar and then after that we'll be singing number 50 speak to me
take your personal belongings uh, with you. And we also could use some men volunteers to uh, handle them and to help uh, put things away. All right, God bless you and you should watch your life.